titled this talk is COVID-19, a 21st century pandemic. What is COVID-19? COVID-19 is the disease caused by the novel coronavirus designated severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, coronavirus 2. The designation 19 refers to its identification in 2019 in Wuhan, China. The designation SARS coronavirus 2 reflects that the virus is the direct successor of its predecessor, namely the original SARS coronavirus causing the 2002-2004 pandemic. What is the disease course in COVID-19? Following transmission of the virus, the virus incubates for a few days up to two weeks before the patient may develop symptoms, although about 25% of patients are asymptomatic. Most patients develop symptoms after four days of acquiring the infection. Most patients have relatively mild disease, which will include flu-like symptoms, in, including fever and myalgia, as well as cough, anorexia, and loss of smell. Um, most patients do not experience any shortness of breath and, in fact, have self-limited disease. 20% of patients are more symptomatic and do have shortness of breath. This is the subset that can develop, potentially develop severe and critical COVID-19, characterized by significant shortness of breath with poor oxygen saturation of less than 90% in room air, requiring supplemental oxygen, which if via nasal cannula alone would qualify according to the WHO as severe COVID-19, but if the oxygen saturation is to a diminished degree that requires intubation and ventilator support, that would qualify as a patient with so-called critical COVID-19. Patients with severe and critical COVID-19 have certain risk factors, including an older age greater than 50, but with increasing risk proportionate to the chronological age. So patients in their 60s, 70s, and 80s would be at significantly higher risk. Hypertension, obesity, pre-existing cardiac and pulmonary disease, and diabetes mellitus. SARS-CoV-2 is a virus. What is a virus? A virus is not a living organism, although it is an infectious agent that replicates exclusively in a living cell. There are diverse hosts ranging from plants to microorganisms to animals. The virus exists as genetic material, either DNA or RNA. And when it infects a cell, the host replicates thousands of copies of the genetic material. A virion includes the genetic material and a protein coat or capsid, which surrounds the genetic material, and in some cases, an additional envelope rich in lipids. Viruses are much smaller than bacteria and can only be seen ultra-structurally and not with a normal optical microscope. Viruses can be grouped by their genomes. There are seven main groups. Group one is a double-stranded DNA virus, such as herpes. Group two is a single-stranded DNA virus, such as parvovirus. Group three is a double-stranded RNA virus, such as rotavirus. Group four is a single-stranded RNA virus, and it includes the beta coronaviruses, including SARS coronavirus 2. Group five is a single-stranded antisense RNA virus, which would be consistent with influenza. Group six is a single-stranded RNA virus that uses reverse transcription for gene encoding, best exemplified by human immunodeficiency viral infection. Group seven is a double-stranded DNA virus that once again uses reverse transcription for genomic encoding, best exemplified by hepatitis B virus. How closely related is SARS coronavirus 2 to SARS coronavirus and the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, MERS coronavirus? SARS coronavirus, SARS coronavirus 2, and MERS coronavirus are members of the beta coronavirus family, representing positive sense single stranded RNA virus. The natural vector is the bat. There is significant genetic homology between SARS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2. SARS coronavirus caused the 2002 2004 pandemic, while the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome coronavirus caused I breaks in the Middle East starting in 2012. SARS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2 enter a human cell via the ACE2, a transmembrane protein found on select host cells, while the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome coronavirus uses a different receptor, namely dipeptidyl peptidase. What are the animal origins of SARS coronavirus? 
MERS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2. They are primarily bat viruses. In the setting of SARS coronavirus 1, the bat, however, does infect the civet cat, which serves as an intermediary host. In the same vein, in the setting of MERS coronavirus infection, the bat infects the camel, which is the intermediary host for the human. While in SARS coronavirus 2, the bat is likely the host that infects the human, although there may also be a potential role for the pangolin or the anteater. What is the basic structure of SARS coronavirus 2? Here we have the single stranded RNA intimately interposed with nucleocapsid, and that in turn is surrounded by a capsid, and this capsid contains membrane protein, envelope protein, and spike glycoprotein. The spike glycoprotein emanating from the surface of the capsid is what enables the virus to eventually gain entry into the host cell. The spike glycoprotein binds directly to its receptor ACE2. The portion of the spike like a protein that binds to ACE2 is the so-called S1 subunit. After binding to ACE2, the next step is for the fusion of the viral membrane with the cell membrane. And that is accomplished via the S2 subunit of the spike like a protein. So the S2 subunit enables the fusion of the viral membrane with the cell membrane. And this is an additional depiction of the spike glycoprotein emphasizing that there are two critical components to, to the spike glycoprotein, namely the S1 subunit, which is the receptor binding motif, and the S2 subunit, which is that stock fusion domain that enables the fusion of the viral membrane with the cell membrane. An experimental drug developed by the American biotechnology company Regeneron Pharmaceuticals is defined by an antibody cocktail representing monoclonal antibodies that target the spike glycoprotein. And by targeting the spike glycoprotein will prevent the binding of the SARS coronavirus to to the cell and therefore prevent its ultimate entry into the host cell. This particular monoclonal antibody cocktail has been utilized to treat mild to moderate COVID-19. How is SARS coronavirus 2 transmitted? Transmission of SARS coronavirus is through direct, indirect, or close contact with infected people through infected secretions, such as saliva and respiratory secretions, or the respiratory droplets, which are expelled when an infected person coughs, sneezes, talks, or sings. Respiratory droplets are greater than five to 10 microns in diameter. Respiratory droplet transmission can occur when a person is in close contact within one meter with an infected person who has respiratory symptoms, coughing or sneezing, or who is talking or singing. In these circumstances, these greater than five to 10 micron respiratory droplets that can include virus can reach the mouth, nose, or eyes of a susceptible person and can result in infection. Droplets that are less than five microns in diameter are referred to as droplet nuclei or aerosols. Indirect contact transmission involving contact of a susceptible host with a contaminant, contaminated object or surface is referred to as fomite transmission. That is also a potential venue of acquiring the infection. In the United States, there have been over 9 million cases of COVID-19 with over 230,000 deaths, uh, hence a 2.4% mortality rate. Like other pandemics, there does appear to be waves of infection. Pandemic waves occur likely reflecting social behaviors, temperature changes, waning immunity, or possibly viral mutations. Just like the 
waves that we're currently experiencing with COVID-19. Similar waves were noted in the Spanish flu pandemic attributable to H1N1 influenza, which killed 50 million people in the 1918-1919 Spanish flu uh, pandemic. What are the disease mechanisms that underlie severe and critical COVID-19 of adults? SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. What causes SARS coronavirus 2 associated lung failure? We breathe in air through the trachea, goes down the bronchial tree and ultimately ends up in the so-called terminal lung parenchyma, which is composed of alveolar ducts and the terminal air sacs called alveoli, which are juxtaposed to small capillaries containing red blood cells. Light microscopically, that terminal lung parenchyma composed of the alveolar sacs and adjacent capillaries has the following appearance. Here we see the alveolar space that contains the oxygen that we breathe. And this alveolar space is juxtaposed to the thin septa. And these septa contain tiny capillaries that exhibit red blood cells. The oxygen diffuses through the capillary endothelium and is taken up by the red blood cells and then transported to the rest of the body. Well, in fatal COVID-19, the lung injury is due to injury to those septal capillaries. The septa, instead of having this appearance where you can see patent capillaries containing red blood cells are severely damaged. The lining cell called the endothelium is injured. There is extensive fibrin deposition, which is a product of coagulation pathway activation found in the walls and in the lumens of the capillaries. And therefore many of the capillaries are occluded by microvascular thrombi. And hence these in injured thrombosed capillaries are incapable of exchanging gas. They cannot accept oxygen and transmit the oxygen to the rest of the body. How does the virus cause the septal capillary injury that prevents gas exchange? Well, the answer is complement activation. This pattern of relatively posti-inflammatory, in other words, not too much inflammation, thrombotic microvascular injury is a very characteristic finding in the type of microvascular injury that occurs as a sequelae of complement activation. We've been studying complement activation as a mechanism of microvascular injury for many years. We were able to demonstrate that the septal capillaries in patients with fatal COVID-19 exhibited fairly extensive deposits of complement, specifically components of complement activation, including C4D and C5B-9. And one can see how the septal capillaries adjacent to the alveolar sp spaces show an extensive staining pattern for C5B-9 and C4B using a diaminobenzidine technique, which results in this brown granular appearance uh, indicative of a positive reaction. What is the complement pathway? The complement system is composed of proteins, including C1Q, C3, C3B, C5, C6, and so on and so forth. The non-cleave complement proteins such as C1Q, C3, C4, C5 are produced by the liver and circulate in the blood as an inactive molecule. They have the ability to be um, stimulated by certain triggers that will result in the cleavage of a specific complement protein into another version of itself, such as C2 into C2A or C4 into C4A and C4B. And eventually the assembly of these cleaved complement proteins um, will form 
the membranolytic attack complex or so-called C5B-9, which really represents the fusion of these cleaved complement proteins, namely C5B, C6, C7, C8, and C9. C5B-9, also called the membranolytic attack complex, drills transmembrane pores into a cell or a microbe and results in its cell death. So while very protective against infections, the complement pathway activation leads to the formation of C5B-9, which could then potentially damage host cells. And if the target is the endothelium of small vessels, this complement activation can lead to microvascular injury and activation of the clotting pathway, eventually leading to clot formation, a finding that was certainly uh, well exemplified by fatal COVID-19 pneumonitis. There are three main complement pathways, the classic pathway, where there is an antigen antibody interaction, the mana binding leptin pathway, which um, primarily involves microbial pathogens, whereby these microbial pathogens have certain um, sugar moieties on their surface that interact with mana binding lectin, uh, leading to complement activation. And then the alternative pathway, which can be uh, stimulated when other uh, complement pathways are activated. Why does the virus cause complement activation in the septal capillaries, which in turn results in microvascular injury, thrombosis, and prevents gas exchange? Septal capillary complement deposition is associated with SARS coronavirus to spike glycoprotein in endothelium. Here we have an interalveolar septa and the capillaries show extensive deposits of both C4D, which is highlighted in brown and spike like a protein, which is highlighted in red. And because there's co-localization of complement and spike like a protein, the capillaries have a somewhat bronzy um, reddish brown appearance. Why does the binding of the spike like a protein and other capsid proteins such as membrane and envelope with or without viral nucleocapsid and RNA, i.e. with or without intact virus occur in endothelium. We know that the receptor for SARS coronavirus 2 is ACE2. So one would assume that the binding of the spike like a protein and capsid proteins on the endothelium that we detected in the septal microvasculature in concert with complement probably is because those septal microvessels express ACE2, and indeed they do. Um, this is a microvessel that is stained for both ACE2 as well as SARS coronavirus 2 membrane protein. And you can see that there is co-localization of both the capsid protein and also expression of the receptor for SARS coronavirus 2 within the endothelium. What is ACE2? ACE2 stands for angiotensin converting enzyme 2. ACE2 is a transmembrane protein that is the functional receptor for SARS coronavirus 2 and allows the virus to gain entry into the cell. The receptor is also very important for cardiovascular health because this enzyme results in the hydrolysis of angiotensin 1, which is a vasoconstrictor into angiotensin 7, which exhibits protective vasodilatory properties. When the SARS coronavirus 2 glycoprotein binds to ACE2, the ACE2 becomes endocytosed with spike glycoprotein and is no longer available to effectively achieve this hydrolytic conversion, contributing to the cardiovascular demise that characterizes severe and critical COVID-19. Well, how does the SARS coronavirus 2 protein and endothelium activate the complement pathway? It would appear that the spike like a protein bound to ACE2 expressed on the endothelium will result in man and binding lectin pathway activation, which is one of those three critical complement pathways. And the reason for that is because the spike like a protein has specific sugar moieties on it that 
are recognized by man and binding lectin and leads to activation of MASP2, resulting ultimately in the formation of C5B-9, which will then drill a hole in the endothelial cell and damage the endothelium. And this is just a cartoon depiction of MAC producing that um, hole in the cell resulting in apoptotic cell death. When there is activation of the man and binding lectin pathway, that will serve as a trigger for alternative pathway compound activation causing further um, vascular injury, but also releasing factors as does alternative pathway activation that will trigger the coagulation pathway resulting in a generalized procoagulant um, state over and above the direct effects of man and binding lectin and alternative compound pathway activation on causing microvascular injury. Patients with severe and critical COVID-19 develop a unique skin rash referred to as thrombotic retiform purpura. It's characterized by this purplish net-like discoloration of the skin. Microscopically, one sees endothelial cell injury with extensive occlusive microvascular thrombi, which is clearly a complement-driven process as revealed by the extent of C5B-9 and other components of complement activation within the microvasculature, really mirroring the pattern of complement-mediated vascular injury we observed in the septal capillaries of the lung. In this thrombotic retiform purpura, using a diaminobenzidine technique to detect the SARS coronavirus capsid proteins, we found extensive expression of SARS coronavirus to membrane, membrane protein in the endothelium, um, the envelope capsid protein, as well as the spike glycoprotein. What was particularly interesting is in these patients with severe COVID who had thrombotic retiform purpura, we found the SARS coronavirus capsid protein not only in the lesional skin and the actual skin that was affected with the thrombotic retiform purpura, but also when we biopsied normal deltoid skin. Um, so it was, it was really quite fascinating that the um, viral proteins were docking to apparently normal appearing skin as well. We had the opportunity of studying many autopsies and we found that there was focal posse-inflammatory thrombotic microvascular injury in other organ systems, similar to what we saw in the lung and in the skin, including the kidney, liver, and brain, as well as the heart. Um, and in addition, there was evidence of larger vessel thrombosis reflective of the generalized procoagulant state that these uh, patients have. And the pathological changes at autopsy largely reflected the ischemic injury that occurred with the microvascular endothelial cell injury and thrombosis, as well as the larger vessel thrombosis. And it was not uncommon to see complement deposition in microvessels in many organs. Um, and what we have here in this collage is utilizing a diaminobenzidine technique. We have highlighted components of complement activation in the microvessels of the heart, in the brain, in the liver, and of course, there is an extensive degree of complex deposition in the septal capillaries. The brain um, was a very interesting organ that was affected in patients with fatal COVID-19. The brain microvessels do express ACE2, although the larger vessels are ACE2 negative. Um, the brain microvessels did have docked spike-like a protein 
and not surprisingly had evidence of complement activation in the microvessel. So very similar to what we were seeing in the lung and in the skin. The extrapulmonary microvascular SARS coronavirus 2 spike like a protein and other related capsid proteins um, more or less mirrored the ACE2 distribution. The deeper dermis and subcutaneous fat, as well as the brain microvasculature, showed the greatest extent of vascular viral capsid protein, including spike lycoprotein, ACE2 expression in endothelium, complement component deposition, as well as cytokine expression, specifically IL-6, TNF-alpha, and interleukin-1. And if one had to rank microvascular extrapulmonary ACE2, the ACE2 positive vessels were greatest in the deeper dermis and subcutaneous fat, brain and liver compared to other organ systems. And not surprisingly, those particular organs had the greatest amount of docked spike lycoprotein and capsid protein in the microvessels. As far as the actual viral replication, as evidenced by in situ PCR detecting the SARS coronavirus to single stranded RNA, it was very limited. It was largely limited to the nasopharynx, alveolar macrophages, and the septal capillaries. We were not able to find this type of SARS coronavirus to RNA outside the lung and nasopharynx with the exception of rare uh, monocytes in the liver parenchyma. And that would indicate that all the docked protein that we were seeing in the skin, brain, and other organ systems really represented pseudovirions, presumably released from dying cells that originated in the septal capillaries of the lung. The true virions were largely found in the lung and nasopharynx ultrastructurally and could not be found outside the lung. When you look at the true SARS coronavirus virion, they have a distinct internal beading which reflects the nucleocapsid intertwined with the single-stranded RNA. In addition, these 80 nanometer virions have to be membrane bound, that's key. There are papers that would suggest that the SARS coronavirus 2 is capable of infecting endothelium outside the lung. And they've shown that evidence using ultrastructural images such as this image. But these structures, although they resemble SARS coronavirus 2 are not true virions. They are not surrounded by a membrane and they don't have that internal beading which reflects the nucleocapsid um, intertwined with the single stranded RNA. These structures which have been published in certain journals as evidence of extrapulmonary true endothelial uh, viral infection, in fact are clathrin coated vesicles which are part of a normal organelle uh, found in cells. So the binding of spike like a protein S1 subunit to ACE2 and endothelium does not require an intact virion, but it can bind to ACE2 as a pseudovirion, as we have seen in the skin, brain, liver, heart, and kidney. A viral replication in the nasopharynx and lung is determined by the immune response and is a critical determinant in disease severity. Patients with severe and critical COVID have excessive levels of replicating intact virus localized to the septal capillaries. Younger patients typically launch a very robust immune response and have very little evidence of active viral replication. And so they usually have asymptomatic disease or mildly symptomatic disease. So what is the pathophysiology that underlies the ability to control the extent of viral replication, which in turn is a critical factor 
in determining uh, disease severity. There are two distinct acral presentations of COVID-19 that provide a critical clue in determining these disparate pathophysiologies, namely the COVID toes or COVID perniosis that we see in young children and young adults who are mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic and the thrombotic retiform purpura at acral sites that we see in patients with severe and critical COVID. And so panel A is the classic COVID toes of the uh, relatively healthy young uh, child or adolescent who develops SARS coronavirus 2 infection. It has a lot of semblance with a condition called idiopathic perniosis, which is thought to be largely mediated by type and interferon signaling such that uh, idiopathic perniosis is considered an interferonopathy. And panel C is this blotchy retiform purpura that we see in patients with severe and critical COVID-19. Well, in the COVID toes of the child and adolescent who is mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic with coronavirus infection, the skin biopsy will show a very robust lymphocytic and monocytic infiltrate. And you can see all this blue staining in the dermis reflects a massive influx of T cells and, and monocytes. So really the skin is kind of this uh, window for understanding why they clear the virus such that patients who do have COVID toes typically have nasopharyngeal swabs that are negative. And because the T cells and monocytes are so effective in clearing the virus, some of these patients don't even launch an antibody B cell response. Well, this massive influx of T cells and monocytes into their skin to produce these violaceous plaques in their toes is reflective of extensive and robust type 1 interference signaling as revealed by the degree of staining for myxovirus resistance protein. We are able to determine type 1 interference signaling in paraffin embedded tissue using the mixovirus resistance protein or MXA stain. Um, a, diabine, a diaminobenzidine technique is used to um, document its presence. And you can see all the brown staining in the skin biopsy in the epidermis and really throughout the dermis, reflective of this enhanced type of interference signaling, which in turn leads to the influx of T cells and monocytes that probably play a critical role in eradicating the uh, virus limiting viral replication and resulting in very mild COVID-19. And this is in contradistinction to thrombotic retiform purpura where the biopsies have very little inflammation and instead one sees this posse inflammatory, that is to say no inflammation, microvascular injury pattern with thrombosis or blood clot formation. And here, the MXA stain is essentially negative. You aren't seeing that brown staining that we see in the COVID toes or in classic idiopathic perniosis, which as I was saying, is considered a form frust interferonopathy. So in COVID-19 perniosis, we have a very striking mononuclear cell dominant interface dermatitis, a dense T cell and histocytic infiltrate. It's attributable to this very, um, strong type of interferon signaling pattern, um, complement deposition in microvessels is minimal to absent. Some SARS coronavirus 2 RNA can be seen, just minimal though in extravascular histocytes, while the SARS coronavirus capsid envelope membrane and spike lycoproteins are not seen at all in the endothelium and are only minimally seen in a few extravascular mononuclear cells. In contrast, in thrombotic retiform purpura, one does not see any inflammation, very little inflammation, 
Instead, there's endothelial cell injury and microvascular thrombosis. There is a profoundly blunted type of interferon response. This MXA stain in panel B is essentially negative. There is extensive docking of SARS coronavirus to spike lycoprotein and other related capsid proteins to the endothelium. This is a diaminobenzidine technique to highlight the spike like a protein, and that in turn results in mannan binding lectin pathway activation with the formation of C5B-9 as the effector mechanism of endothelial cell injury and illustrated in panel D is C5B-9. Also, the patients with severe and critical COVID have very high levels of certain cytokines in their blood, uh, such as IL-6, and the endothelium that has the myelin binding lectin activation through the spike like a protein, myelin binding lectin engagement um, expresses high levels of IL-6 to suggest that the endothelium, in fact, is the source of the high cytokines seen in patients with severe and critical COVID-19. So the pseudovirions, which are the spike like a proteins and the attached parts of the capsid are released from the virus in dying endothelial cells, and they dock to ACE2 positive vessels, leading to complement activation throughout the skin and fat and other organ systems. These ACE2 positive microvessels with docked protein could serve as a fuel for distant vascular injury and thrombosis due to crosstalk between the complement pathways and the coagulation cascade. And the fact that the ACE2 is very strongly expressed in microvessels in the fat provides an excellent pathophysiologic construct for obesity as a risk factor for severe uh, COVID-19. Patients with severe COVID-19 do have elevations of certain cytokines in their blood, such as IL-6. Well, what are cytokines? They are small proteins produced from cells, including lymphocytes, where they are called lymphokines and monocytes, where they are referred to as monokines. However, cytokines can also be produced by endothelial cells, which are the blood vessel lining cells. Cytokines work in attracting other cells and interleukins, which in turn influence other cells. Since there's little inflammation in severe COVID-19, where does the elevated cytokines come from and what role do they play in severe COVID-19? Increased cytokines in severe COVID-19 originate from endothelium likely due to man and binding lectin pathway activation. Um, we have found that the ACE2 positive micro vessels that have the docked protein with complement deposition uh, are the ones that will uh, show evidence within the endothelium of these various um, cytokines. And um, why this enhanced cytokine expression endothelium is important is it can lead to and promote platelet aggregation, at least as it relates to IL-6, and certainly contribute to the um, thrombotic tendency that seems to be key to the pathogenesis of severe and critical COVID-19. Well, what about the vaccine? Vaccine candidates induce both cellular and humoral immunity. During COVID-19 infection, vaccinated individuals clear the virus through neutralizing antibodies, activation of the complement pathway, and engagement of helper and cytotoxic T cell effector functions. When one is creating a vaccine, um, it is important to understand the immunogenicity of the various components of the virus. It uh, turns out that at least with SARS coronavirus 2, the nucleic capsid protein, the capsid membrane protein, and the spike glycoprotein are excellent candidates as they do uh, generate a significant T cell and B cell antibody response. Most of the vaccines, however, have focused on the spike glycoprotein, which is the critical protein that enables the virus to gain access into the host cell. So more Moderna has developed a nucleoside modified messenger RNA that encodes SARS coronavirus to spike. Pfizer um, has a similar messenger RNA that encodes 
S protein receptor binding domain, that S1 subunit. The AstraZeneca utilizes a modified um, adenovirus vector that encodes, once again, the spike glycoprotein. Janssen uh, uses the modified adenovirus vector that encodes the spike glycoprotein. The primary endpoint is to basically have the vaccine and not get any evidence of COVID-19 of any severity or any laboratory evidence of infection. So the two vaccines that are um, going, at least the Pfizer vaccine, which will be available soon, um, is this messenger RNA that is delivered through an intramuscular injection into the muscle using a lipid-based nanotechnology. Once the messenger RNA is in the cell, it will encode the spike glycoprotein, produce the spike glycoprotein, which will then be secreted, recognized as antigenic by dendritic cells, resulting in both a um, cytotoxic T cell response, but also generating a neutralizing antibody B cell response. So in conclusion, with a blunted type of interferon response, SARS coronavirus 2 being endothelial tropic, replicates excessively in the lung, microvasculature, although not elsewhere, apart from the nasopharynx and liver, microvascular complement activation via spike glycoprotein and mana binding lectin engagement results in septal capillary injury um, as the basis of um, the severe and critical lung injury in um, patients who have very bad uh, COVID-19 um, and again in severe and critical COVID-19 patients, the SARS coronavirus 2 pseudovariants are released from the damaged endothelium in the septal capillaries disseminating systemically and localizing to select ACE2 positive vessels resulting in mana binding lectin mediated complement activation and endothelial based cytokine expression leading to vascular injury and thrombosis and hypersetic anemia. The mana binding lectin activation amplifies the alternative pathway and activates the coagulation pathway leading to distant microvascular injury and thrombosis. The enhanced expression of IL-6 and other cytokines such as interleukin-1, TNF-alpha um, from endothelium likely contributes to the procoagulant state. And the end result is microangiopathic acute respiratory distress syndrome and significant multi-organ microvascular injury and a procoagulant state in the setting of severe and critical COVID-19. There are risk factors such as um, poor type one interferon signaling, complement dysregulation, and obesity. We understand a lot about the pathophysiology of the virus resulting in more efficacious therapeutic interventions and the vaccine development has been at an accelerated rate with fairly impressive results. Thank you.